Hey everybody, um, in this lecture I'm going to cover two molecules you already know to be a part of the plasma membrane, and those two are proteins and carbohydrates. There are several proteins that are laced throughout the membrane, and um, they all, excuse me, they all serve different functions. So I'm going to talk about each one and you should take notes on what each of them do the other macromolecule is the carbs um the carbs that we find throughout a membrane or a plasma membrane cell membrane they're um usually branching from the membrane they serve as like markers and i have here that you should think of them as fingerprints they help you to identify a cell not you specifically but one cell to identify another cell so we're going to explore that and what you should understand about those things and their importance. And let's go. So before we cover the two bullet items, I wanted to address the difference we encounter when we study the membranes of various species because it can be important. So what's interesting is that um, not all species have the same cell membrane makeup. And what's more interesting is that there's some species that are able to change the composition of their membranes in response to changes in their environment. So these changes help the cell and consequently that helps the species to continue to thrive. And so what we want to do is just really quickly describe the variations we note um, and make sure that we understand that they're a driver of successful adaptations and that can lead to or lend itself to rather evolution. So without these changes, there are a lot of species that would be wiped out. So think about all animals and plants that are able to survive scorching summers and the coldest of winters. Um, part of the reason they are successful is due to their ability to keep cells alive despite the drastic fluctuations. So since we um, mentioned the cell's ability to thrive in these drastic changes, we know that the cell membrane is the first line of defense in maintaining the cell. And so for that reason, we attribute um, these differences in the cell membrane to driving evolution. Um, there's also like a couple of interesting studies about bacteria, specifically E. coli. They have some really interesting lipids that they use as their cell membrane and they change according to temperature as well. All really fascinating things. but. We will not digress any further. So now on to the idea that there are several types of proteins that are interlaced within the cell membrane. So scientists have studied the various proteins that make up the membrane mosaic. Remember we talked about the fluid mosaic model, how it's like a bunch of pieces that represent this whole image when we back up from it. So the types of proteins we see present within, um, within the membrane, they can tell us about the function of the cells so here again is like the chapter one concept that structure dictates function so there are two situations that we can encounter when we take a look at a cross section of cell membranes they use something um like a like a freezing technique where they so a scientist would essentially like freeze the cell they split it and then they're able to see this cross section that's how it's done like just really briefly um so what we see is in in, in one instance, when we look at this cross section, we might notice that there are membranes that are embedded in, or excuse me, there are proteins that are embedded within the membrane, and we call those integral proteins. So we've noted that some of these proteins can be seen um, from only one side of the bilayer, and then there are others that actually traverse the entire membrane. And the ones that traverse the entire membrane, in other words, they go through the membrane top to bottom. Those are called transmembrane proteins. It's a fitting title because it, it goes from one end to the other. Um, the hydrophilic regions um, of the proteins stick out at both ends. Um, in other words, the, the way to describe that is that they're, um, they're consistent with um, the water affinity that the phosphate groups and phospholipids have. Um, so you have the portion in the center of these being hydrophilic, I mean, excuse me, being hydrophobic, they're water fearing, just like the hydrocarbon chains um, that we know hate water. So these proteins, the way that they're held in place, basically it's the cytoskeleton at work. 
if we were to look at another cross section, what we might find is that there are some proteins that are only on the cytoplasmic side of the cell membrane. Um, sometimes they'll even be anchored like right on top of the cell membrane and we call those peripheral proteins. So if you think about um, your arms and legs being peripheral parts of your body, they're not the center, they're kind of hanging on the outside. That's the same way that these proteins are working. They're hanging out on the outside. All right, so we're looking at really quickly figure 5.6. It's the structure of a transmembrane protein. They point out this alpha helix structure, which you know is a part of, or what happens when you do protein folding. You can get this or beta pleated sheet. In this case, we're looking at alpha helix. The N terminus and the C terminus just deals with um, how the polypeptide chain um, is laid out. Of course, this is a fully folded protein ready to go to work. So um, I guess it's interesting to note that even though we're done with the folding, we still see some of those properties that come along with various amino acids being at the top or at the bottom of a polypeptide chain. Uh, so and then here we're looking at um, the extracellular side. So we're outside of the cell there. And then this is your cytoplasmic side and remember this one is a transmembrane protein that means that it goes straight through straight through the membrane all right so in this slide we list the six major functions of various membrane proteins so we've got transport so some proteins are there for transport some of them are um, there for enzymatic activity so they they basically are catalysts. They speed up chemical reactions that need to happen. Uh, we have signal transduction proteins present. There are cell cell recognition proteins present. Intercellular joining proteins. And then we have some that are there just for attachment to the cytoskeleton and the extracellular matrix. In figure 5.7, we're looking at pictures of all of the ones that we just named. Um, so we have A as transport. All you see is some blue molecules here at the top. And then we have an arrow that's saying that they're going into the cell. So it's literally transporting molecules. We have another one next to it. It's also transporting molecules, but this one is actually going against the concentration gradient. And you'll understand what that means in a second. But basically we have less of the red molecules here and they're more here. Things don't normally move that way. They want to get away from each other. So the fact that we have to push this molecule out into the space where it does not want to go, it requires ATP. Um, and we're transporting stuff out whether or not it wants to go out doesn't matter. The other one is free and happy to just come on in because there's not a lot of the blue molecules that we see in the um, inside of the cell. All right, and then in B, we're looking at enzymatic activity. So again, you have these like products, you wanna put them together. The enzyme is there to help make the two attach and you get a brand new product out of it. In C, signal transduction, this is literally gonna start a cascade of things happening. Um, and we'll talk more in depth about specific examples. There are, I think, three that you have to know. C, um, that was C. So D is cell cell recognition. So now we're looking at that glycoprotein thing. So remember, it's the protein with the carb branches hanging off of it. I've already said that carbohydrates act like a fingerprint or they help with cell recognition. So for one cell to recognize another cell, there's enzymes involved, or excuse me, there's proteins involved with um, these branched carb chains hanging off of them. Then we got some intercellular joining. Remember gap, joint, gap junctions and blah, blah, blah from the last chapter. Um, that's the intercellular joining. And then finally, we have those proteins that are there simply to attach to the um, other parts of the extracellular matrix, namely the like cytoskeleton that is on the outside of the cell. So that's going to be only in animal cells because plant cells don't have an ECM. So now that we've looked at the various types of proteins that you can encounter within the cell membrane, let's talk about the role of carbohydrates. So when we look at the cell-cell recognition model in the previous slide, 
I pointed out that they're proteins that have carbohydrate chains that are attached um, and they're called glycoproteins. There are also some lipids that have carbohydrate side chains attached and they're called um, glycolipids. So it, it fits what it is made out of. Glycolipids, so you have the carb piece with the lipid, glycoprotein, you have the carb piece with the protein. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the carbs are covalently bonded to the proteins um, and what you need to remember is that the carb chains can be diverse so they can vary in the number of sugars they can vary in the sequence of those sugars they can also be different in the way that the branching occurs within the carbohydrate itself and these chains are what make the cells identifiable um, so different species they'll present different carbs you can also have variation um, from like one individual to the next on top of individuality within an organism you can see differences in carbohydrate presentation within a single organism so what we've noticed is that we can see different glycolipids and different glycoproteins based on like where the cell is within the organism itself so one phenomenon many of you are probably familiar with deals with blood donation and transfusion so the way that this works is that we categorize blood as being type A, type B, type AB, or type O. And we also look at something called the RH factors. And this is where you would get that negative and positive part of your blood type. So the reason why all blood types are not okay for mixing, it deals with the recognition of carbs presented on the cell membrane surface. If you were to receive blood from a donor that is not a match, it sets off an immune response and the alert comes from your native cells recognizing the difference in the carbohydrates that are presenting um, on the incoming transfusion supply. Um, it could also be the lack of a carbohydrate that would set that chain reaction off. It just depends on your blood type. So type O, they have no carbs present. Type A has type A carbs type B has type B carbs and type AB would present both A and B carbohydrates. So this is why O would be a donor or a universal donor and AB would be a universal recipient because if you have type AB, you can recognize type A um, carbs, you can recognize type B carbs, and then you could recognize type AB carbs together. So now that we've covered the different types of proteins that we can see um, within the cell membrane and also whether or not they're embedded or if they are just kind of like peripheral so integrated versus peripheral um, and then we've talked about carbohydrates and the role that they play as glycolipids and glycoproteins we should talk about the inside of a cell membrane um, and it's different uh, in structure from the outside of a cell membrane so this is the deal um you know that there are phospholipid bilayers and the phospholipids by themselves would not cause any huge difference in the inside versus the outside but because of the variation that we see in transmembrane proteins and integral proteins we get um a difference noted in the overall structure of the the membrane so if it was strictly the phospholipid bilayer, we could get away with the inside and the outside being identical. But once you add in those proteins, they start to look a little different. So the arrangement of the proteins is actually decided, or the arrangement of the proteins and the lipids is decided by um, how the membrane is constructed by products that come from your endoplasmic reticulum and your Golgi. Um, so even though the cell membrane is the first line of defense we still need that endoplasmic reticulum to produce the correct products and we need the um, Golgi to package and tighten them up correctly and then where they're distributed affects how it looks like or you know like what is present versus what's not present and so the inside and the outside don't always necessarily match um, so here's the last slide
So this is figure 5.8. We're looking at the synthesis of membrane components and the orientation that they have within the membrane. So in this picture, this is what we see happening. I'm going to highlight as I go through. So just realize that this portion of it is endoplasmic reticulum. Um, it appears to be mostly smooth, but I do see where, I don't know, there, actually, no, I don't see any ribosomes, studded ribosomes anywhere. So we're just going to go with this is ER. They just call it, they just are calling it endoplasmic reticulum. They're not even specifying. Um, so from the ER, we know that the vesicles that are coming off of it are going to take the products made from the ER and transport them to the Golgi. So when this transport happens, uh, so like if we look here, this is from the ER going into the Golgi and we see that there's a glycolipid that is um, constructed and the glycolipid because it's lipid we know that it would be coming from the smooth ER um, and the protein part of it would have come from the rough ER so we've already traveled through um, let me see what else do we see in this image okay so we also see that there are some transmembrane glycoproteins up here um, and we also see them coming from the ER they're put into a vesicle carbohydrate is attached and then that vesicle again will be further processed in the Golgi um, so from the Golgi we have a pinching off of various vesicles that contain different combinations of glycoproteins or glycolipids and from there, they're going to be pushed out along a cytoskeleton track to the membrane itself. Now, whether or not we're going to orient as a transmembrane protein, like this one, transmembrane glycoprotein, or if we're going to actually just completely secrete the protein made, um, or if we're just going to attach a membrane glycolipid, it just depends on where the Golgi is sending it out to. So it's kind of like they're already marked for the place that they need to go. Um, and once they get there, it in effect can slightly shift the membrane, change the membrane, and therefore it is consistent with that fluid mosaic model. All right, guys, I'm done. And I'm out. Goodbye.